thanks for the introduction. Can you all hear me? Yes. How about if I stand over here, can you all hear me still? Yes. All right, excellent. So I might wander around a bit. So um, I'm a bit of a nerd, and just to warn you, this is going to be an absolute nerd fest. There's going to be Star Wars, there's going to be Star Trek, and all sorts of other things. Uh, so I'm going to give you a few films, I'm going to give you five of my favourite science fiction concepts. And then I'm going to pick them apart and tell you, is it real? Could we do this? Is that true? That kind of stuff. But I want it to be interactive. So you've all got your lollipop sticks with coloured paper. I'm going to ask you five questions throughout this talk. And I'm going to give you four possible answers and I want you to hold up the right colour for whatever you think the answer is. Now I promise you this, some of you might be thinking, oh I'm a bit nervous, I don't know whether I should hold my colour up. I'm not going to single anyone out. I'm not going to pick on anyone. If you get it wrong it doesn't matter. It's all about learning stuff as well. So, bear that in mind and uh, I'll explain to you first the whole inspiration behind this. As I said, I'm a bit of a nerd. And when I watch films, I'm always asking the question, is that true? Is that possible? Could we do this? It makes watching films a bit stressful sometimes because I get a bit irate when the, the, the directors get it wrong, but that's okay. So, I thought, me, wine, PowerPoint and the internet, I'll put this presentation together on what the science fact behind our science fiction films is. So as I mentioned, I'm going to ask you five questions. There'll be five, uh, four possible answers, and I'm going to put a time on it. You're going to have five seconds to hold up your colour. So once that's done, I want you to hold up your colour, and then I'm going to go through the answer. So, first up is nature versus nurture. I'm going to show you a short clip, and for each of the five, I'll show you a short clip that will introduce this idea. Ten fingers, ten toes, that's all that used to matter. Not now. Now, only seconds old, the exact time and cause of my death was already known. Neurological conditions, 60% probability. Manic depression, 42% probability. Essential deficit disorder, 89% probability. Heart disorder, 99% probability. Early fatal potential, life expectancy, 30.2 years. Okay, so this idea of nature versus nurture Comes, is present in a few films. The two I'd like to highlight, one is Gattaca, brilliant film if you haven't seen it. In this film, Vincent, the character, overcomes his genetic destiny to follow his dream of becoming an astronaut. And in Divergent, it's a futuristic society where society is divided into five different factions and you have to fit into one of the five listed here. So it gets, gets you thinking, well, you know, what's more important in determining who we are? Is it nature or nurture? So first let's define what we mean by nature versus nurture. So with nature, what we mean is our genes, what we inherit from our mum and dad. That's what nature is. With nurture, it's the environment around us and the way we live, what we eat, our sun exposure, whether we develop bad habits like smoking and our upbringing. So we could say, rather than nature and nurture, we could say genes and environment. So here's the question. What's more important, do you think, in determining who we are? If you think it's nature, hold up white. If you think it's nurture or environment, it's blue. If you think it's equal, it's green. And if you think it depends, it's yellow. So, hold up one of your colours. Okay, so we've got, I would say, mostly green. Okay, there's a few yellows. There's one of everything, actually. So, well, it's good because I'm going to give you the most accurate answer first. It depends. 
But here's the thing, with this question, if you held up any of the others, you're kind of right as well, and I'll explain why. So here's a good example. Some things are almost entirely caused by genetics. Eye colour. And this girl here, she has blue eyes. They would always have been blue. It doesn't matter what she ate, what she drank, how she lived. They would always have been blue. And it's the same for everyone else here. But there are other things that are caused by environment, such as the freckles on this girl's face is caused by sun exposure. So if she hadn't have had as much sun, she might not have had, have had freckles or as many. And some things can be influenced by both. I'll give you an example. Height is mostly caused by genetics, but if you don't eat the right foods or enough foods, well then you'll never grow as tall as you otherwise would. But let's think about this a bit more like scientists. Scientists look at this in a certain way. They take identical twins and they take non-identical twins and they compare the different features of the two groups. Now, identical twins have the same DNA and non-identical twins have different DNA. A lot like a brother and a sister would normally. They have different DNA. So you'd expect the identical twins to look more similar, behave more similar, get similar diseases more often than the non-identical twins. And what we find is, if you look at the way we look, then it's mostly genetics. If you look at the way people behave, then it's a mixture of the two. It's genetics and it's the way you brought up and your experiences in your life. Okay, on to the next one, human cloning. So I'm going to show you another clip. The sound on this is a bit quiet, so you might have to listen carefully. Right, so human cloning is in a few films. Here's a few of my favourites. Star Wars 2, Attack, Attack of the Clones. So a clone army is created to fight alongside the Republic, or so they think, and people who are Star Wars fans will know what I mean by that. Then there's this other film, it's probably more for the grown-ups, but in this film, Sam works as a miner on the moon, but he finds out he's just one of many different clones. It's also in Blade Runner and this other film here. So what is cloning? Well, cloning is when we create genetically identical copies of an animal. And when I say genetically identical, I mean they have the same DNA. So what have we cloned? Well, we've actually cloned a lot. A lot of different animals have to date been cloned. You might be familiar with Dolly the sheep. And this was uh, a sheep that was cloned in 1996. It's important to remember this was really difficult. It took 276 attempts before they actually managed to clone Dolly the sheep. But way back in 1958, a guy called Professor Sir John Gurdon in England, he cloned a frog in 1958. And he did this by moving DNA from one tadpole to another. And that was way back in 1958. But what was the first animal to be cloned? Well, 1885, a scientist in Germany managed to clone something called a sea urchin, which is what is shown here. And he did this by embryo splitting. Really simple, he took an embryo and he shook it up and it split the two cells in that two cell embryo into two separate cells and then they grew up into identical sea urchins. 
And this is a list of all the different kinds of animals we've cloned to date. So you can see a lot of different animals. So here's the question. Can we clone a human? If you think it's a straightforward no, it's white. If it's a straightforward yes, it's blue. If you think we already have, it's green. And if you think theoretically, but we've never done it, it's yellow. Alright. We've got almost all yellow here. I reckon that's pretty smart. Theoretically, yes, but we've never done it. So let me explain. You may have heard a while ago that on the news that we cloned a human. Well, this was back in 2005. Scientists in South Korea said they'd done it. And they published two really, really big papers that were internationally acclaimed, but it turned out they made their data up. It was all made up. And since then, because we've cloned so many things, experts say it's likely that we could do this, but it's not whether we can, it's whether we should. They consider it ethically wrong to clone a human. And there's a reason why. I mean, why would we want to, right? I've already told you that environment plays a huge role. So we could clone Einstein, but would we get the Einstein on the left or on the Einstein on the right? They'd most likely behave differently to the original Einstein, look, uh, maybe even look different, like different things, and have different abilities. So it depends on how you're raised as well. Okay, telekinesis and the 10% myth is the third of my five. Okay, so the 10% myth refers to this idea that we use 10% of our brain. And telekinesis is one of the things that Lucy is meant to have developed when she can access more than 10% of her brain. And telekinesis features in many films. We've got X-Men where mutants have telekinetic powers. And if you're wondering, telekinesis is the ability to be able to move things with your mind. That's what telekinesis refers to. And it also features in Star Wars, where we use the Force to move things with our minds, and in Green Mile. So here's the question. What fraction of our brain do you think we use? If you think it's 10%, like in the movies, it's white. If you think 50%, hold up your blue. 100%, hold up green. And if you think it varies between people, hold up yellow. I'm seeing mostly yellow. Right, I'm seeing all four there. <laughs> you can't get up all four. <laughs> all right. Most of you think it varies between people. The answer is we use 100% of our brain. Now, I've said this to some people, and even after I've explained it, they <laughs> blindly refuse to believe that we use 100% of our brain. I'll tell you a few reasons. We know for sure we use 100% of our brain. We can actually visualize brain activity during scans. Now, it depends on what we're doing as to which part of the brain is more active. If we're walking or moving, then the parts of our brain that control movement, they light up. And right now, you are processing 400 billion bits of information every second, but you're only aware of around 2,000. So that shows you most of the activity of the brain goes unnoticed, and it controls things like digestion and breathing and heart rate 
and blood pressure. There's a few other reasons that we know that we use all of our brain. If you have a limb amputated, the part of the brain that controlled that limb will be diverted to controlling another part of your body. So it gets reused. And if even slight brain damage can cause massive drastic effects. And that's not really consistent with this idea that 90% goes unused. Now, you might also be familiar with the concept that the left side of our brain is more analytical and logical, and the right side of our brain might be more creative or intuitive. That's not true either. So, you might have been called left-brained or right-brained. Well, there's no evidence that any of us have a predominance or prefer to use one side of our brain versus the other. We, both, we all use both sides of our brain equally. So the idea of telekinesis, well, the electrical activity in our brain really only spreads, reaches a, a few millimeters past our skull. So this idea that we could manipulate the environment around us with thought doesn't really make sense. Now I told you it was going to be a nerd fest, and Star Trek is number two for me. It's actually managed to predict loads of things that have come true. So Star Trek was around in the 1960s and predicted the idea of mobile phones, just little handheld held mobile, fo mobile phones, as well as universal translators. We now have a universal translator on our phones if we want them. <coughs> Tablet computers were predicted by Star Trek as well, and we now have those everywhere. And virtual reality, or they called it the hollow deck in Star Trek, that was also predicted, and we can now do that. They even predicted the hyperspray, which is a type of spray that injects medicines through our skin with air pressure rather than with needles. But here's the technology we really want. We want a Star Trek doctor, the kind of doctor that could just hold a handheld thing and go, D -d 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 -d, that's what's wrong with you, I can see inside your body, you have this disease. We really want cloaking devices, we could walk around cloaked and hide things from people. Tractor beams, that would be awesome. And teleportation, if you're unfamiliar with teleportation, here's a short clip. Ten seconds. <laughs> Which of these can we do now? Right, so I'm going to explain. Star Trek Doctor is the technology to see inside the body and diagnose people. Cloaking, I've shown. Tractor beams and teleportation. If you think we can do all of these, hold up white. If you think just Star Trek Doctor and tractor beams, it's blue. If you think we can only do Star Trek Doctor, it's green. And if you think all of these are science fiction, hold up yellow. of everything here. I'm going to go mostly yellow. You think, most of you think it's all science fiction. This one is going to blow your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Alright? Let me explain why it's, in some way we can do all of these things. 
The Star Trek Doctor, I think, We've got that. We can see inside the body and diagnose what people have. We can do that with ultrasound, we can do it with MRI, and we can diagnose a whole range of different diseases without even touching the patient. What about cloaking? Well, we've got a couple of different types of cloaks. We've got optical cloaks, and this is one that was invented in Rochester. And we call it the Rochester cloak. It uses lenses to bend light around an object to make it invisible. You can see through the object that you're cloaking. Not just around it, you can see through it. There's also a type of nanomaterial, we call it, called graphene. And this is a single atom thick. It's made of carbon. And it's carbon arranged in, um, in hexagons. And you can make a sheet of this stuff and wrap it around certain objects. And when you apply a certain frequency, it cloaks the object. And it does this by scattering the light so that it's invisible. Light doesn't bend soften and reach your eye. And it's tunable. What I mean is you turn the frequency off, then you can see the object that it's surrounding. If you turn it back on, you cloak the object again. So what about tractor beams? Well, here's an example of a tractor beam, the first one that was invented. Now, if you take the definition that a tractor beam is moving something without touching it, well, then this was the first. And it used, um, it used acoustic energy. It used sound waves. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, that's not a tractor beam. A tractor beam uses lasers, right? Not sound waves. Well, we can do that as well. This is a, page, a, a paper that was published in a journal called Nature Photonics, and it uses a laser to move objects. Ooh. That's a video, I hope it works. Finally, according to a study published at the end of last year in Nature Photonics, science can actually do all this. The scientists used a new design that lets a single beam pull and push gold-coated hollow glass from both tens of centimeters. It doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a lot. Plus, they actually built one in real life for real. This real world tractor beam uses a donut shaped beam to grab a sphere. Then, by varying the polarization of the beam, the researchers can push or pull a sphere and then reverse it, and all in one little donut. The sound and the image is a bit off, but. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd show that clip just in case you thought I was making it up. But it's true, we can use lasers to move objects around. And it would work in space. You don't need to have air to be able to get it to work. So, the last one, teleportation. Surely, we can't teleport things. Well, we've actually managed to teleport photons. Now, this is the first step in quantum computing or the quantum internet, which basically means we can send data to other, other places without a physical link. Now, it, it's kind of a teleporting information rather than things physically. The thing that you're teleporting gets destroyed and then it emerges somewhere else. And it, they managed to do this in Canada over six kilometers and it works by something called entanglement. So I looked this up and I thought, I'm going to find out what entanglement is. Don't be alarmed by the next slide. This is the person who invented entanglement's explanation, simple, as simple as he could put it. So <laughs> what I'd like to say is, it's confusing. He describes it as the instantaneous and disembodied transfer of the photon's quantum state onto the remaining photon of the entangled pair. I'm glad we got that sorted out, right? Everyone clear on what that is? Excellent. That's the face I pulled when I read that. We can do it. I can't explain to you exactly how it's possible right now. Finally, number one, Jurassic World. Here's a short clip.
Okay. <laughs> Probably had, was a bit longer than it had to be, but I knew all the kids would want to see that. <laughs> and I know every kid in here is thinking, but the T-Rex wins. I wanted to see it all. <laughs> so, here's the question. Is it possible to bring back extinct animals like dinosaurs? If you think categorically now, yes, we can do this, it's, it's white. No, we definitely can't. It's blue. If you think we've already done this, hold it green. And if you think it depends on the animal, yellow. Okay. I can't call this. What do you think? Blue? We're going to go with blue. We can't do it. All right. Some of you think it's blue, some of you think green, a few think yellow. All right, so here's, here's the answer. It depends on the animal. I underline the word possible. And this is actually a field of research that's called de-extinction. So what do we need to bring back an extinct animal? Well, we need the DNA. And we need a mum. We need a surrogate to be able to, to nurture the developing embryo. So, what could we bring back? Well, the woolly mammoth, we could do this. So the woolly mammoth went extinct. Most woolly mammoths went extinct about 10,000 years ago. But what you might not know is, up until 3,600 years ago, there were still woolly mammoths around. And they were on a tiny, geographically isolated island in just off Siberia. So they actually survived when the Egyptians were building pyramids. In fact, the pyramids of Giza had been around a thousand years and, uh, when the last of the woolly mammoths died. And the reason we think we can do this is because we have well-preserved woolly mammoths that have been frozen in Siberia. But there's an animal alive today that could potentially act as the mother, and that would be an elephant. Now, I'm not just, this isn't crazy talk, because in 2011, Japanese scientists said that they were going to try and bring back a woolly mammoth, and they gave themselves five years. So that's this year. I don't think they're going to do it this year, but it's possible they could bring a woolly mammoth back. And we've completely sequenced the woolly mammoth genome, so we know the complete sequence of the woolly mammoth's DNA. There's other animals, like the Tasmanian tiger. This only went extinct in 1930. So actually, there's well-preserved specimens of Tasmanian tigers as well. So we definitely have access to the DNA, and there's probably an animal that could act as a surrogate mother. We could bring back perhaps the dodo, which was exterminated about a hundred years ago, I think. There's a, even the woolly rhino, which we have specimens preserved of uh, in, in, uh, that have been discovered frozen in ice. <coughs> what about Neanderthal man? It's possible. We've sequenced the Neanderthal genome completely. We know the complete sequence. It's not really could we, it's probably should we. Should we really bring back Neanderthal? Because guess who would be the surrogate? It would be a human. And who is going to volunteer to be the surrogate for a Neanderthal? I mean, you never know what might happen. So what about dinosaurs? Well, the problem with dinosaurs is fossilised remains don't contain DNA. Fossilized means all of the organic material in that skeleton, all of the flesh, has been turned to stone. So there's no DNA left. So we cannot obtain dino DNA. Even though in Jurassic Park, you may remember, they found a mosquito preserved in amber, that really is impossible. The mosquito would not be preserved, the amber would not be preserved. That would also be stone by that point. 65 million years, it's too far back. So I'm just going to wrap up with the top five that I went through. Number five was nature versus nurture, and I hope I've convinced you that both our genes and our upbringing is important. So it is possible for certain things 
that we can overcome our genetic destiny by living the right kind of life. Human cloning, theoretically, is possible, but really the question is, should we? The 10% myth, remember, we use all of our brains. Why would we have the other 90% if we don't actually use it? We use all of our brains. For the second one, it was Star Trek. We have Star Trek doctors, we can do this. We have tractor beams, cloaking devices, and I think we're on the verge of pr producing teleportation at the level that you saw in the clip. You know, maybe a hundred years we'll be able to do that, but we can <coughs> teleport photons right now. And finally, de-extinction is possible, but probably not for dinosaurs, sorry to say. So thanks for listening. I hope you've learned something, and I hope you believe we use all of their brains. <laughs>
And it's just a question of in a few centuries we could build it bigger and better, right? You could see the International Space Station above Newcastle a couple of months ago. Went across the skyline. What about down here? If we cloned an animal like a woolly mammoth, where would they go? Well, the island that they were last found, that they, they survived up until 3,600 years ago, that's where we should put them. Because they were doing very well until humans came along and then it all went downhill for them. So we should put them back and leave them alone if we ever do bring them back. One last question. Up the back. Yep. Um, if we did bring back animals like wood mammoths, could they be able to adapt to like, climate? That's a good question. And I think the problem with bringing them back is I don't think they would ever be exactly like they were. So it would be really touch and go whether they would live and survive and adapt to what, we, what the world is like now. I don't know whether they would, but you've got to put them in the habitat that you know. Like the woolly mammoths would have to go in the Siberian tundra or on the island that I mentioned. But you wouldn't put them in the tropics because they definitely wouldn't survive. <laughs> Guys, you've been a fantastic audience today. Um, before we put our hands together to thank Dr. Luke, I've got a little present for him. It's a Hoyt's gift card so that he can go and see his next sci-fi movie <laughs> before he comes back and does another presentation for you guys hopefully next year. Thanks, Dr. Luke. Thanks.